Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey, bosses. Welcome to episode 95 of Invest Like a Boss. I'm here in Bangsco, Bulgaria, and (laughs) Sam is in Tampa, Florida. Welcome, buddy. Why do you, you say that laughing like it's boring and not interesting like Bulgaria? Well, both Bulgaria and Tampa are pretty boring. <laughs> I think we're both in our kind of uh, comfort spaces where I, th- I, you know, I think it's actually perfect. This is both places where we kind of just go back to relax and rewind in between, you know, kind of more exciting places. Yeah. Well, if that becomes that type of place for you long term, that'd be pretty cool. I uh, I think my prospects for Tampa are limited to one year, but for now it's serving its purpose. I have a good setup here. I got a good desk. And I bought a nice lamp. You know, I'm doing all these <laughs> domesticated things I never thought I'd be doing. But now that it's set up, it's been like a month of, you know, all this BS shopping. But now that it's set up, I'm actually starting to enjoy it. You know, I got on my balcony at eight in the morning, have a coffee get prepared to talk to you, put on all my makeup, <laughs> and uh, and now we're ready to roll, ready like to, to seize the day, baby. So how far are you living from where you went to college? College was for about four-hour drive. So I actually never knew anything about Tampa until after college uh, and still learning it, still really learning the lay of the land. There's a lot of, a lot of different areas of Tampa. It's a big-ass city when you start talking about driving like to the coast, St. Pete, Clearwater. Uh, but I'm kind of right smack in the middle. I'm looking forward to showing it to you sometime. I think there's this, there's, it's all about neighborhoods wherever we live, right, Johnny? Yep. Um, Chiang Mai is probably famous for that, like where we live in, in Neiman. Uh, and this is like, this is the exact same thing. It's a neighborhood that is a bubble and you very much live in the bubble. And I, I, I don't, you know, drive anywhere that I need to. I just walk and it's all right here, which is pretty cool. So I'm curious, how does this apartment that you're living in now compare to the apartment you lived in when you're in university? Well, I lived in the fraternity house in university, so <laughs> uh, my pl- the place I lived was so incredibly bad by some people's standards, like my mom's, that when she showed up, she started crying. She, she actually saw the, wow. the room I lived in. Yeah, it was bad. But for me back then, that was it was perfect. It was like a little cave. Yeah, there was rats under my bed, but it was perfect. I lived with 35 <laughs> of my best friends. We always had a keg on ice, and life was fantastically good. That's so funny. So I went to UC Irvine in Southern California, kind of really boring town, um, mm-hmm. great for retirees. And I moved in to a $250 a month apartment there. Mm-hmm. And the only reason why it was so cheap was I had three other roommates and I lived in the living room. So everybody, you know, had their own room or shared a room. <laughs> there's two, one person, he had his own room. Uh, mm-hmm. there's two guys sharing a room. And then I basically sectioned off a corner. And used a $50 mattress that I bought at the flea market, and that was my space. Wow. That is so funny that you mentioned flea market as well because I have an interesting story about a flea market, but I haven't even heard of that word flea market except maybe once every three, four years. <laughs> well, should, should we uh, save that story or do you want to tell it now? Yeah, we'll, say, we'll save it for the outro because it's important for this episode. But – yeah, I mean, two fifty for a place in college, I, I mean, that's, that's cheap. That's about what you're paying in Bulgaria now. Yeah, but, um, but here I get. I, think a, I was paying like three fifty at the fraternity house. What's ironic is the first off, it's ten years later, so there's inflation, and I'm paying mm-hmm. two fifty a month for a two bed, two bath apartment <laughs> versus yeah. having a corner of a living room in Orange County, California. So that's the difference. Yeah. Wow. Well, you still did well back then. Um, I'm glad your roommates put up with you and let you live in the living room for all that time. Yeah. So these are things that you know. I wish that I would have dove in deeper or I would have learned, you know, in a class or in university or, you know, probably actually in, in high school. I think these mm-hmm. are, you know, these kind of financial lessons, um, budgeting, you know, planning and paying bills. I got lucky that my parents were frugal, especially my dad, um, that I kind of didn't plan very well. I just spent as little as possible. And even though I technically had budgeted more, you know, I probably could have could could have had shared uh, a room for five hundred dollars a month or six hundred dollars a month. In my mind, I was just like, "Let me live as cheaply as possible." So I didn't yeah. really have the financial background. I didn't understand money investing or even saving 
I just knew to live as cheap as possible. So I got a little bit lucky. But I think there's a lot of people who, you know, didn't have the, um, that growing up and they ended up leaving college with so much more debt and into their future. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So in this episode, guys, we're going to talk about financial tips that your college professor didn't teach you. And we're going to have on Michael Taylor. He's a college professor. He also writes two columns, one in the Houston Chronicle and the other in the San Antonio Express on finance. And he used to also manage a distressed debt fund on Wall Street. Uh, So he's going to have a lot of good insights. And Johnny and I are going to discuss in the outro kind of our own personal uh, advice for college students and people graduating. And this is important for A, if you're young and just starting out, but also you know, if you're in your 30s, 40s and you're, you have a kid or maybe you have a niece, nephew, it's so important to get good advice from you know, people you look up to when you're at these, this age and try to make it relate to them in a way that is interesting because investing is just not interesting when you're 15 years old and thinking about your financial future isn't either. You know, you're thinking about what's What's the next day hold? What's the next basketball game hold? What's the summer camp hold type of thing? So it's it's important to learn how to relate these type of important topics to youngsters. Yeah, I definitely agree. I'm glad we're doing this episode. I'm glad that there are professors out there like like him because these are the kind of guys, you know, Michael's the kind of professor I wish that I had in high school or in college, uh, especially in university. I think this should be a requirement. So let's mm-hmm. take a listen and then I look forward to catching up with you after the episode. Enjoy this discussion. Welcome back to Invest Like a Boss. Today we have on a show a gentleman out of the charming city of San Antonio. I love San Antonio. Michael Taylor. Michael, good to have you on the show. Sam, thank you so much. I'm glad you like San Antonio. It's a lovely city. It is. It is. And I'm also in Tampa, June 1st. That weather is starting to crack on into the summer. (laughs) I'm sure you're hiding indoors as well as I. 100s every day and as far as the forecast can see. (laughs) So aside from being a previous Wall Street guy, and I know you write also for the Houston Chronicle and the San Antonio Express, you also teach a personal finance course at Trinity University, I believe. That's right. Yeah. Great. I mean, so you're, you're obviously a perfect guest for this week's episode. And I'm just, let's just, why is it as a, you know, as a professor, you probably see it more clearly than anybody, but why does it seem like professors have a difficult time understanding finance and especially teaching finance at a collegiate level, at all levels, but really a collegiate level? Yeah, this is a, that question has kind of been an obsession of mine. um, And there's, lots of answers, and I've been thinking about it for a long time. I'm curious to know what you think, but I'll start with a couple ideas. One is, I think it's personality. The kind of the kind of people who you and Johnny are and kind of natural entrepreneurs is almost the exact opposite of what a professor is. I mean, I think of a professor, and I am one myself, so I'm, you know, I'm guilty of this too, but people who don't necessarily, I, I think it's the opposite of an entrepreneurial mindset uh, is kind of part of it. Um, I think there is a tradition of we don't um, mix very well between people who, say, worked on Wall Street or literally gone about trying to make money with money, um, who then go on to teach in the university setting. So there's like a disconnect between theory. You know, an economist who study economics is very different from a, a practitioner who's been an investment advisor or, a, in my case, a bond salesman. Um, so there's a you know, you would teach these things differently. One of the things that I think uh, professors are most guilty of if you're teaching finance is approaching it like a CPA. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think about my, my time at Goldman, like every time you get promoted, you go through another training session. And every time accounting came up, I mean, I would be uh, my doing that head bob thing. I just could not possibly like record the accounting words. It just yeah. was, it's the worst way to learn finance. So finance is not accounting. Finance is a it's a mixture of lots of things, um, but it's not that. So it's got to be made more exciting. And, and I think so somewhere between personality types of professors, somewhere, somewhere where there's not a lot of interaction between business and teaching, um, a, a huge difference between what either accounting or economics is compared to what, you know, practical personal finances is, is a big part of it. Um, you know, that, that, that's it for starters. Um, did you learn, did you find you learn stuff in school that was practical for being an entrepreneur or making money, you know, maybe I'm overly, I'm, I'm dissing professors too much. I'm curious what you felt no, in, that, from your professors. That was my exact experience. I was just thinking as you're 
discussing your points on that back to my college days. I went to Florida State University. I, I thought the mm-hmm. education was laughable, but it was a, a hell of a lot of fun. So uh, I was happy. Well, that's something. Yeah, right. <laughs> but the yeah. the only finance courses that I can really remember taking, I was a, a marketing major, uh, mm-hmm. were, was managerial accounting and financial accounting. And they were, mm-hmm. I mean, they were, they were by far my least favorite courses. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and I'm pretty good at math, but just the, the things that they, that they taught were so impractical to what, what I needed in finance, which was to understand like compounding interest. And hey, if exactly. you start investing now instead of going out to the bar and blowing $150 this weekend, what that could be for you in, in 35 years versus, What's the net present cash flows of this annuity stream uh, that I like? I couldn't understand and wrap my head around like annuity when you're 19 doesn't sound cool at all, right? right? But having it, it's very uncool, yeah, right. But but accumulating money uh, does. So I think just you know that, and I, I can't speak for all professors, but I think a lot of professors at least at my school, they just spoke directly from the book, whatever the book said. It was not at all real life experience. This is what I've been through. This is what I've seen happen in the real world. Here's how to apply it type of thing. So, or This is how people make money. This is what practitioners think about. Practitioners do not use accounting terms. You know, So mm-hmm. like I, I went out trying to find a, a textbook for this course when I first taught it in 2013, and we got the, the so-called best textbook. It was you know clearly mm-hmm. written by a CPA, to train CPAs. And I'm trying to teach non-business students personal finance, which, you know, from my perspective, is like the most important thing you could possibly learn in college, which isn't taught well. But I just knew if you go with the CPA textbook, you know, written by the CPA, you're turning people off from finance forever. And Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. You know, you guys do a podcast which is directed towards people who I'm going to guess are are somewhat already, already oriented towards finance and entrepreneurship and money. So you have a, you have people there's, I think there's a thing where people who are already interested dig deeper and you keep digging because you're like, this is, this speaks to me. So then the, how do you reach the, the, I don't know, 70, 80, 90% of people who are not oriented that way, you right. know, who don't want that. That's a real challenge. Cause like, you know, I think of my wife who's a, a doctor and she cares nothing about money. And it's like, so I'm, whenever I write stuff, I'm like, what would my wife think about this? Cause, cause if I can't reach her, then I can't, you know, I can't reach that. 70, 80, 90% of people who, who aren't naturally interested in this stuff. Yeah. And, and, and approaching with a CPA's approach is like, <laughs> that's death. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Um, anyway. So what, I mean, yeah. when, you, when your personal finance course, I'm curious what you, like how you actually go about teaching that. Is that, I mean, you have accumulation of, of so much experience and, and also, of course, book smarts and you're a published author and you write for this, these newspapers. I mean, how do you, how do you put together that itinerary for that course? Great question, um, and I'm still tweaking with it. There's lots of improvements I could make. Um, the first couple of things, and I and I try to do it in order of importance. The first couple of things, I'll just throw these out there. Um, one is to teach a deep skepticism about how people are absorbing their financial information already. Hmm. Uh, and the short answer, or the, or the short lesson there is, if you were to only absorb stuff about finance from TV, internet, and, and frankly, newspapers, and again, I'm guilt, I'm describing myself because I write for the newspaper, you would miss a lot. And, and um, I guess my answer to that is you kind of have to read books <laughs> and right. not just, you know, uh, TV. The second thing I spent a lot of time doing with students, and it, it is a, a pet peeve of mine about how do you learn finance, is despite the fact that, you know, half, half to 70% of people are math allergic, there are some super duper, uh, not complicated, but seemingly, you know, uh, difficult, but it's not mass formulas that you can do in a spreadsheet. Compound interest, you already mentioned it, is the thing. Like if you, if you want to know why people say what they say in personal finance, it all comes back to either compound interest or it's inverse discounting cash flows. And if you can get that and you can get a, a non business student to do that math and feel like, Oh, I can actually program this stuff. And as you said, you know, should I spend $150 in cocktails or should I invest it in what happens in 50 years if I did that? That insight, which you can get through math, I think is a game changer. Um, and it's a, it's a huge uh, pet peeve of mine that most personal finance books, they refer to the idea, hey, you should not spend all your money on cocktails. But they don't really show the person how do you do that math. So for me, that's a huge, 
if you can get a even a non-business oriented person to just hey I, i'm going to force you to do this thing with a spreadsheet um there's some like extraordinary i think insights into oh so that's why they keep talking to me about high interest credit card debt that's why they keep talking about, about retirement accounts that's why they keep talking to me about savings and um, you know, and, and, you know, back to the thing that you're like, I, I don't want to hear about that. Like annuities, like what is an annuity actually doing? And is it, is it a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> you know, right. I think the math is, gives you the insights into that. Right. What, uh, you know, college kids today, like I, I'm trying to think back when I was in college, I actually, I had a small investment account and I was actually, I was, I graduated in 2008 and I can remember mm -hmm. I was like four or five days before graduation and the market was tanking and I looked in my account and I had lost like $2,200. And I, I seriously thought the world was going to end and like my life was like over. Right? You know? 2200 bucks. You're like, and, uh, oh, so much beer. Yeah. Right? I mean, and that was, <laughs> I, that was really, really challenging. I mean, that, I can distinctly remember that day. There was a hole in my wall and, you know, I didn't understand it. And I think a lot of this goes into, you know, just again, personal finance and, and having some type of basic understanding in high school, um, definitely in college of, you know, diversi diversification, of course, debt, mm -hmm. um, retirement accounts, things like that. Yeah. And I, I just never had it. I'm sure there was the options to take it as like an elective, but in, you know, I was a business major, mm -hmm. but, but it wasn't taught to me. So I think that's got to be pushed a little bit more at all levels of school and, you know, now more than ever, it seems like everyone's go everyone's graduating with some type of debt, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure how many kids are actually thinking about investing when they're in college. But you know, what's your advice on this, and what do you see in your personal finance class in terms of students with debt versus students th wanting to invest? Yeah, I mean that is a that is an amazingly important question, and it's one I hope that uh, twenty somethings are thinking about. Like, should you know, it's the classic thing: should I pay down my debts or should I invest? And I have an answer. Uh, it's in the subtitle of my book, but um, I'll tell you what we do in the class, which is I try to I just berate them. Like, you need to start this thing. I know you have no money or you have five dollars, but mm -hmm. here, download the the Acorns app or figure out a way to automate some tiny thing. And in a sense, it's irrational because you know, there's not a lot of money they're going to put aside and they have debts. But um, going back to, you probably know the book, um, The Richest Man in Babylon. Love that. Sort book. of a super duper simplified, but really powerful. Like even when you're in debt, you need to, of course, address the debt, but you need to set the, the baseline for success in the long run. And, um, you know, it's a combination of giving people permission to invest while at the same time addressing the debt um, and also the encouragement, like, by, if you set that base the way that um, it's described in The um, Richest Man of Babylon, by the time you've extinguished the debt, you're already, like, huge steps forward. Um, so I uh, I have an assignment. Of, I, I, I drill into them. I don't know if you've spent any time with the Acorns app, but for me it's an amazing mm -hmm. sort of solution um, to – I have no money, and yet I, I've been told I need to start investing. It's just a nice on-ramp to the thing. Uh, but I also do an assignment where they have to take all of the steps to opening up an IRA. Now, some people don't have income, of course, if you're 20 and you're a full-time student. But some do. You know, They're working in the summer or they have uh, uh, jobs. So for those who have any income at all, up, you know, at least 500 bucks or 1000 like you can open up this IRA, and frankly – you should tell your, and I, I forced this in the early years of my course and I've, I've gotten less forceful since, but I was like, you need to tell your parents that if you have a thousand dollars of legitimate outside of the home income, it is a requirement of your course that you start your IRA for the thousand dollars. Now, like you it. know, they were, there's some squirming there and, but you know, uh, you probably know this. If you, if you earn a thousand dollars legitimately, you could blow that on actually the cocktails and your parents could put in the thousands. So I was actually trying to just tell them, like, yeah. if you have middle class or above parents, I'll tell them you're going to get a C in this class unless you start the area. Now, you know, there's a limit to how much I can threaten people, but, but I was trying to just give them the lesson that this is so important to start this before you're in your, you know, where everyone else starts is like late thirties and forties. If you start in your twenties and, you know, again, do a lot of math to show this through compound interest, there is no way you wouldn't end up wealthy. You have to end up wealthy if you started this in your college years or the years afterwards. You you cannot you cannot not be wealthy. It's like impossible. Um, which I I think they come away with the uh, the message which I teach in lots of different methods. 
the issue of debt, because ever you know, which is half of your question before, mm-hmm. uh, we have way more debt than when I was in college, which is the mid '90s, and when you were in college in the late 2000s. Um, so there's there's more debt. Uh, it's fortunately it's at pretty low rates of interest, but it's a it's a kind of a national scourge. You know, people are getting into debt, and, and the worst is getting into debt and not, not finishing college. There's no easy way to address it, but um, I, I am a believer that you do need to address it, but you need to start baby steps, some on ramp to investing even before you distinguish it. And, right. and the, you know, there's lots of reasons for it. But yeah. yeah. I, I just, that's a, that's like, just, you have to do this. There's, uh, I don't have that much experience with debt, fortunately, except for my, my monthly credit card stuff. But, you know, the interest rates on debt can be, Pretty extraordinary. I think I think credit yep. card interest rates can be up in like the twenty percent. Um, but yeah, student, legally twenty nine point nine nine. Twenty nine point nine nine is the is the national legal anti usury rate. Um, uh-huh. And you know, other states will regulate it lower. But all these credit card companies are located in North Dakota because they have uh, the most permissive laws. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, but then student debt will be much lower, right? That'll be somewhere around like four or five, something in that range. Yeah, ninety at this point, ninety five percent of the student loan market is federally subsidized, and as a result, it's in the kind of four percent range. Right. And you know, it, interest rates going up, so in another year or two, it will be higher. But for now, it's quite low rates historically, not on historic cases. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like you know the, the if you have credit card debt, it's almost like you gotta you gotta figure a way to get that out quick. But if you have right. only student right. debt, you know, there's a little bit of flex there that you might say, okay, I'm gonna. You know, I'm going to slow down paying off this debt so that I have extra dollars to invest. Yep. You know, playing with the the returns and stuff. You could probably make a case that you could make outsized returns by investing versus paying down the debt at a at a quicker rate. That's right, and you're you're absolutely right that the main distinction there is figuring out: Do I have a high interest debt? You know, classically credit card debt, but and there's other worse kinds. Um, for which there's almost no excuse uh, to not pay that down as aggressively as possible. Um, but low interest debt is a very good case to be made, as you're saying, for investing at the same time that you're addressing your low interest debt. So I, from a, you know, what do, what does a college student need to know? You need to know the distinction between high interest debt and low interest debt. And then you need to know, and you know, you got to know which is which. Um, and then you got to know, um, what are the long-term consequences of allowing high interest debt to fester and essentially hollow out any chance you have of ever getting wealthy while you have high interest debt? versus what are the long-term costs of low interest debt which are dramatically different and are compatible essentially with building wealth over time, like having a low interest mortgage, like having a low interest car loan, because you, you, you may need that, uh, and like having low interest student loan debt, which allows you to acquire skills and you know raise up your game and um, it's a signal to the job market of what you're able to do if you have degrees you know, mm-hmm. uh, above high school. So yeah, it, that, but as you're saying, the huge difference here is high interest debt and low interest debt. And it is a somewhat scary at my somewhat elite university that I teach how little people know which one they have hmm. and what are the mathematical consequences of high interest versus low interest debt. And distinguishing between them, I think, is the difference between, you know, getting wealthy on purpose or getting either remaining poor or getting wealthy by accident. You know, <laughs> if right. you don't know that distinction, you have to know that distinction. So yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah. Now, when it comes to asset allocation, when it comes to just general in- investing advice, when we're, we put debt aside, we know we got to we got to service any debt that we have. We got to take care of that. But we also need to start investing and getting our at least our feet wet and understanding this stuff. What do you recommend for asset allocation? What should people be investing in when they're eighteen to twenty two year, years old? Presumably, that's the age of the kids in your class or I, they're not kids anymore, right? Oh. They're adults. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. 18 to 22. And, and I'll apply this to anybody in their twenties. Frankly, I'm a little bit of a zealot. I'll apply this to anyone in their thirties and forties, maybe even fifties. Hmm. Um, uh, the, the asset allocation question. Um, and I have the freedom to say this because I'm not an investment advisor. So frankly, I can't be fired by anybody, but, um, uh, my answer is almost always inevitably, if you're investing, which really means you need growth of your money for the long run, you need to be in one side of the ledger and not the other. And that the ledger is there's only two assets in the world. Um, and I didn't make up this phrase, but I, I'll credit a guy named David Hultstrom, uh, his investment advisor, who said there's only two assets in the world. There's risky assets and there's non-risky assets. And you got to know which one is which. And um, 
for young people especially, but I'll say it for myself and even people older, older than me in their 50s, only risky assets are, <laughs> are going to give you any positive return on your money. So you should only invest in risky assets. Um, and, and you guys address a lot of risky assets um, like real estate investing or like stock investing and frankly entrepreneurship. You know, Owning a small business or a large business is an extremely risky asset. And those are the only ways you can grow money. You can also lose money, of course, um, and and therefore you, you have to know a few other things. But for money that you're investing for the long run, and especially if you're in your 20s, I feel extremely confident that they should only be exposed to risky things. Uh, and, and then, of course, you have to couch that and say, risky does not mean buy lottery tickets. There's a lot of risky things that are also stupid. But um, so it doesn't mean, you know, buy a, a one in 10,000 chance of this thing happening. But the only way you'll grow your money is if you are in risky things. And the, the easy to access, the easiest to access risky things are diversified stock, you know, either ETFs or mutual fund portfolios. Uh, the next easiest is individual stocks, which has um, some downsides for that because you may end up undiversified. Mm-hmm. And then the, the harder to access risky things, but are still available to people of some effort and and some knowledge is real estate and small business ownership or entrepreneurship, mm-hmm. or you know either starting or helping start or or funding a creation of businesses. Now those are harder to do and they require either both higher risk tolerance and some probably some skill and some access to people who can help you. But in a way that diversified stock mutual fund doesn't really require that much access to skill or other people to help you. It's, it's pretty much at this point could be made super duper simple. But it, any, in any case, 100% risky for me is where a young person should be. And to the extent that they're in quote unquote investing in bonds or annuities or, or CDs or, or cash, you're simply losing money after inflation and after taxes. It's just, a, you know, which is, which it's, which has its place. Savings should be in savings, but mm-hmm. investing should be in 100% risky things. That this is my, extremely <laughs> strongly held view that I wish um, I wish people more people would teach. Um, and I, frankly, I wish more investment advisors would allow for that. But I have a I have my theories about why they don't. But yeah, I, th- I agree. Totally. I think bonds don't make any sense for young people unless they simply want to buy a bond fund just to see what it's like to see what maybe a little mm-hmm. bit of a, a higher distribution is, although it's going to be, you know, you get taxed at a higher bracket with that ordinary income. But of course, yep. I think if you ask almost anybody who has been investing since college, that you would they would say, "I wish I had been investing in only you know stocks or the broad stock stock market since college," because yep. in, almost in every case, their returns would have would have been outsized. Uh, and yeah, that, but the only I guess the only caveat I would say to that is yeah, it comes and it's all about this episode is that it comes with the understanding of what you're in as you've been discussing all through through all these points. You have to know what you're in. You have to understand, is it risky or not risky? And you have to understand what's going to happen in certain environments. Because like me in t- you know, 2008, I'm in my, my fraternity house. I open up my, my Schwab account and I've lost $2,200 on paper and I panic yep. because I didn't yep. understand my investments, right? If I had yeah. been in maybe yeah. 50% bond funds, it would have been a lot less. I've been like, ah, it's not too bad. Um, but I just right. didn't, I didn't understand anything at that point. But if I had kept all my, my stock investments at those times instead of selling at the bottom, uh, you know, I would have done very, very well, uh, over the course of the last, how long has it been since college? 12 years? Right. 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. 10 years. You know, you know me better than, uh, yeah, you know my age better yeah. than me. <laughs> Quick math, right? That's right. Um, yeah. So, so it comes, recalls to mind another great sort of aphorism, uh, which, uh, is the, the one of the worst things that can happen to an investor is having success early on. So I guess maybe the opposite is true for you. You're like, you had that experience early on when the stakes were still, they seemed high, but they're relatively low for you. Um, which is wow. When you invest in stocks, you can lose a lot of money. Um, and, uh, I guess I would add to that. The only guarantee I have about investing in stocks is the market will definitely go down 30% on you. There, I don't know if it's happening in a week or a year or in 10 years, but it's definitely going to drop 30%. And then the issue is what do you do next? Um, and you, you, you experience that. So now you know the answer to what do you do next, which is don't sell it. Um, it's only on paper, but mm-hmm. uh, if you don't have that, training um, or that experience of having lived through it. And when it does drop 30%, you think, oh, maybe the world is 
ending and this whole market is a rigged game and these stocks are bogus and I should have been in bonds all along, which I think would be the wrong lesson to take. Right. The right lesson, um, you know, and is the market will definitely go down 30%. You will lose a lot of money at some point. That's, that's for sure. Um, and then do you know yourself well enough to know what you will do when that happens? And this is similarly true or even to a more volatile extent when you invest in real estate or, or businesses, either as an angel investor or, you know, um, or start your own thing. Mm-hmm. It will be very rocky and volatile. And then, and then do you know yourself well enough to know what you'll do? In, in the case of real estate, because there's so often debt and leverage involved, you know, do you, mm-hmm. do you have a cushion of safety there? Um, so there's a lot of, you know, specific to each market. But um, yeah, it, as a young person, you have to, you have to know uh, that it's going to be volatile. And then you have to know that, um, I think, for the money that you've invested, you have a time horizon that fits what you put your money into. So like, you may not have been able to lose the 2200 bucks. Um, but if you're like, ah, my time horizon is 10 years, and you're like, ah, it doesn't matter, then that would be a safer way for you to invest in, um, in that risky thing. You were in the right stuff. Uh, it's just that other piece of like, it will go down. <laughs> what yeah. are you going to do when it goes down? Because right. every investment advisor should have had that, have had the talk, right? This mm-hmm. is going to happen. This is, doesn't mean the market is broken. It doesn't mean you've done the wrong thing. It doesn't mean stocks are not appropriate for you. It just means you just didn't know. You know, it's right. just going to happen. Let's talk about so. compound interest for a minute. Oh, yeah. You know, this, this is something that it's the eighth wonder of the world. To some people, yep. um, it's some, it's a concept I heard very early on, but again, very difficult to wrap your head around, I would say the math, but also, you know, just the, the time horizon. Like when you're, when you're 18 years old and people are giving you, well, if you do this until you're 60, it, it doesn't make sense to you because you're like, hey, it's, that's 40 years from now. I don't know if I'm going to live yeah. that long. Do I even want yeah. money when I'm 60? I want money now type of thing. So, you know, how do you get this message across to your students? And like, and what is the actual magnitude of of being able to rein this message in at a young age? Yeah, I mean, this is my this is my mission right there in a nutshell. How do I teach compound interest? And then it's um, mathematical counterpart discounting cash flows. So uh, I'm, I'm remembering my math teacher in high school. We're learning the math called sequences and series, which is kind of the, the baseline for the compound interest formula. And he's like, just kids, if, I, I'm 50 years old now. Had I understood this math and the implications for finances, like I wouldn't be teaching you anymore. I'd be so rich and retired by now. I'm like, really? Okay. So I mean, I think math teachers and finance teachers should just drill down this is life changing. What you're about to hear is, as you said, the eighth wonder of the world. Um, so first, they have to know it and the importance of it, and to present it as this is a this is going to change your life. This is how you guarantee that you're wealthy. Working against that is the problem, which you pointed out. You know, the 18 year old picturing myself as a 60 year old. I mean, this is very abstract. This is not the way. You know, I, I'm not a biologist, but I assume our monkey minds are basically built on what happens in the next five minutes: fight or flight, you know, mm-hmm. fight or flight, and we don't think in monkeys are not built in we're, we're part, we're mostly monkey, right? We're, we're not built to think 40 years from now. Let me, let mm-hmm. me not, you know, get, eat the banana. Let me not, you know, order the cocktail. And let me think about it for you. It's, it's sort of an impossible thing for our brains. Right. Um, my solution in class teaching personal finance is, all right, everybody open up a spreadsheet. We are going to drill down. I'm going to show you the math, show you how to design the Excel spreadsheet to give you the answers. We're going to do this over and over again until you overcome your monkey mind. You start to go, Oh, rationally 5,000 bucks. Does 5,000 bucks in my IRA at age 20 matter. So, you know, a couple of examples. So you put 5,000 bucks at 3%, let's say a, a really good bond return um, for 40 years. So you're 20 year old, you want a 16, 16,310 bucks. Mm, you know, that's certainly not life changing. If you say instead, what if you could get a 12% return, which I'll agree is, is a bit above what you should expect in the stock market, but it's also not outrageously impossible. Um, 5,000 bucks in 40 years is $465,255. Mm-hmm. You know, it's half a million dollars from $5,000 is, I think, probably life changing um, and is something people should know. And then you can, if you've programmed your spreadsheet, all right, and you can play around with it and then. I have one in front of me. So at 10%, 
you know, your 5,000 becomes 226,000. So, you know, a quarter million dollars. And that's just 5,000 sitting there. It's yeah, not, it's, that's, that's not a adding to it. Investment and no, that's a single investment into your IRA. I'm, I'm using the IRA because that's 5,500 limit right now. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a lot for a 22 year old to come up with, but it's not impossible. You know, you, if you have a decent job, you could plausibly save that and contribute to your IRA. Right. Um, and, and then, you know, then you can go from there and, and figure out, all right, well, so that's, that's sort of bond market investing or stock market investing. What if you were able to, in your mid to late twenties, accumulate like a $50,000 nest egg? Again, it's, it's, it's impressive for somebody in their twenties to put that together, but it's, not out of range of somebody who's employed and, you know, counts their pennies and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And you take your 50,000 and you're like, all right, so what is that going to become? Um, well, at 12%, that's 4.6 million in 40 years, which is a single nest egg in your twenties, you know, at age 25 to age 65, it's four and a half million. You're kind of done. If you, you know, mm-hmm. if you, have, you put together 50 grand at age 25 and you can invest it and earn 12% for 40 years. Four point six million is it's uh, I, we don't know what the cost of things will be in forty years, but it's it's going to be something good, and it's nice to think. Hmm. So you mean at age twenty five, I could be most of the way there, mm-hmm. and you could. Um, and then if you uh, and you guys um, admirably enough for sort of push the entrepreneurial approach to things and entrepreneurial lifestyle, and now I want to link this to an idea that I didn't really get until I was in my thirties, um, and I quit my Wall Street job. I'm like I'm going to start a business. Um, and because I started to figure out that entrepreneurial, uh, approaches to wealth building is the only way to have, uh, you know, blow your doors off money. Mm-hmm. There's, there's the, you know, there's the get a good degree, get a good job, become a CPA, accountant, doctor, uh, attorney and, and earn high income. And, and that's, and that's a comfortable lifestyle. But if right. you want to blow your doors off money, that has to be entrepreneurial. So, you know, and I think of, so just going back to compound interest, if you had your 50,000 as a 25 year old and, uh, and I sense this is a kind of an underlying message of what you guys are talking about. If you had your nest egg and you were like, I'm going to go put it into a risky thing. I'm going to do a startup. Um, what if that earned, you know, 25% compound growth for my life at, at, for 40 years. Now we're, now we're talking very high success here, compounding growth, 25%, not something you can get in the stock market, not something you can get in doing ordinary things, but a plausible thing you could get if you had a successful startup or a successful entrepreneurial venture. Right. Um, and you did that for 40 years. Well, the math of compound interest says that's $376 million. Um, and, and you go, wait, <laughs> for $50,000, that's, that's outrageous. That, can't, that math can't be right. And, but it is absolutely right. You know, mm-hmm. apply compound interest, $50,000, 25% growth per year, 40 years, $376 million, which okay. I would say precisely describes that's the entrepreneurial yeah, no, that's that's sort of Silicon Valley wealth. That's that's entrepreneurial, um, very you know low low probability but plausible success. That's what that's that's what that that's twenty five percent growth for forty years, um, which I think is a, a, a thing people should know. All right, so going into the you know we're talking about entrepreneurship. Obviously, there's the U.S. tax code. The U.S. tax code does not necessarily benefit employees of the system as much as it does entrepreneurs and capitalists, investors, et cetera. Is this something that you ever even get into in your courses? Because I think this is one of the most important things for young people to understand is that when they get in business by themselves or there's a, a, you know, a, a contractor you know, self-employed, they are much more tax efficient than if they are an employee. Yep. That is a huge lesson that I think, unless you had a parent who was entrepreneurial, there's no way you'd know that in college. Um, the way I say that, uh, the way I present it is I put up a picture of Adam Smith and Karl Marx. And I'm like, all right, you guys, who do you think writes the tax code? Is it the capitalists or is it the people representing labor? And like, they don't really know because they haven't really read Adam Smith and Karl Marx. But, but the, what the lesson is, The tax code is written by and for capitalists. It's not written for labor. So if you are setting about, as the majority of people are, to be a good employee and to work for somebody else and get a salary, I think people should know that that means you will always be taxed disadvantages in a disadvantaged way. Mm -hmm. The tax code is not written for you. The tax code is written for the owners of your business, your boss. It's written for the capitalists who either run the business 
or they make their money from capital. So dividends and capital gains are taxed at advantageous 20% rates. Um, big piles of money invested in municipal bonds are taxed at zero, which is delightful. Um, inheritance at this point after the new tax reform is taxed at zero up to the first 22 million. That is 100% written by people who have over <laughs> $22 million. That is a, you know, a direct uh, giveaway. Um, and so I think the tax code is telling you, A, the best way to be wealthy is first inherit the money. And if you can't do that, uh, then just have a big pile of money. And if you can't do that, earn money from your money. Don't earn money from your labor. Um, and so there's a, uh, it's sort of fun in a university setting to say radical, what I would consider radical statements, which is, you know, uh, I put on my Marxist hat. I'm like, you guys, if you don't know this, like th this is entirely <laughs> written by capitalists, um, which I've never, I don't think that is a thing that most people know. Um, and then, you know, so you can be, you could be, as most college students uh, have a liberal bent of mind, they're like, well, that's super unfair. I'm like, well, sure, it's unfair, but what are you going to do about it? A, you can vote. But B, I think the next thing you should do, at least until you can change the tax code, is be a capitalist. Like, arrange your affairs so that you make money from your money or from your ownership rather than being paid as an employee. Because if you decide to be paid as an employee, man, you are just, you're just going to pay a lot of taxes in your life. Right. Um, so there's the, you know, be a radical, you know, college student and be it up in arms about the way that the tax code is written, but then be practical and, you know, design your life. Don't be a sucker. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> like, try to try to build up a nest egg so that you can make money from your money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're not born wealthy, um, then clearly this isn't a thing you can do day one out of college. But you then have to work as hard as you can, I think to accumulate money so that over time you can phase out how much money you make working for somebody else tax at a high rate to how much money you make on your money or on your investments um, and be taxed at lower rates. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you know, that, that could take, um, you know, I tell them, look, that could take decades to get there um, to shift the, how are you taxed as a worker, or as a, as an owner, but you got to get there as fast as possible. And I, I think that that lesson, I, you know, I didn't know that lesson growing up. My parents um, are not entrepreneurs, so that took me a long time to figure that all out. But I think it's a powerful thing to know, you know, arrange your affairs such that you are, you're making money as a capitalist, not mm -hmm. as a laborer. Uh, it, it can't be emphasized enough. So you've been, you know, you're, you're with college students pretty much every single week. And then you've, of course, had your previous career on Wall Street. You've been around millionaires and you're around college kids in debt and assumably a lot of people in between at all different types of income and wealth levels. And I have always had this, this, uh, well, we've, we've used this, this, uh, example on the podcast before that even as you go up the income level, it's not always as easy. It's not always easier to save money. Do you, you know, back in your wall street days, you were around all these millionaires and stuff. Like, is it easier for them to save money than it is for someone that's out of college that's making 50 K? Yeah, that is the, I, I don't think people know this, what you're, what you're talking about here, but yeah, so I'm, I'm in my late twenties. I'm making a, a really good salary plus bonus. The problem is, uh, and you know, I'm selling bonds at Goldman Sachs. So like top of the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And according to my expectations for how much money I would make in my life, as well as, you know, all my peers from, from high school and college, I'm making really great money. It's awesome. Unfortunately, I'm living in the, one of the most expensive places in the world, New York City. Um, and, you know, walking around New York City, you sort of drop money. It's just like, it just sort of flows out of you. It's a very expensive <laughs> place to live. Um, but then the worst thing is, if you are friends with other people on Wall Street, and if you sit next to them all day long, you have to do the things that they do. So you kind of have to go to very expensive restaurants. Frankly, you know, I wasn't at that level, but at a certain level, you have to have the NetJet partial membership, right? Yeah. Because then you can't socialize with folks if you can't get on a jet and get to the same parts, right? I mean, you have to start spending the money to stay up with your friends. So, yeah, my rule is there is no level at which uh, it's easy to save money. Uh, and the more money you make, inevitably, the more people you know who make a lot more than you. Mm -hmm. And that is that was so true on Wall Street. Like, And, you know, the worst day on Wall Street is bonus day. Cause like, I got my extraordinary bonus. But now you know all these people who made four times what you made on bonus day <laughs> and you hate them because you know they have half your talent and you're like so pissed 
but the more so the more people you you know you make a lot of money and then you're like ah oh, these other people make so much more money and you know how do you you, you can't have the worst car or you can't right. not go to the, the vacation that costs a lot of money um there's a book that i love by andrew tobias the only investment guide you'll ever need and he's got this whole thing on saving money and which i've unforgettable for me. He's like, you know, let's say you make $40,000 and you are just barely getting by, or even you're in debt, you know, you're not getting by in 40,000. The weird thing is somebody down the street making 35,000 is actually paying all their debts. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then, you know, and somebody else across town is making 150,000 and they're in extraordinary debt, you know, and they're like underwater. And you're like that, you know, there is no level at which it's easy to pay all your bills. And, you know, there's lots of famous people uh, that come to mind, Billy Joel and Michael Jackson and um, Mike Tyson, who've made hundreds of millions of dollars and then they went bankrupt. Yeah. Um, so it's really, you know, lifestyle cost is a, is with us always. And the more money you make, the higher your lifestyle cost will be because your friends are making a lot of money and they have expensive tastes. Yeah. I think that's a really important, a really important lesson too, because also, you know, t taking into consideration the taxes in New York, will kill you on a million dollars. I mean, it'll make, that's oh, yeah. enough to make you go depressed right there. And oh, yeah. so if you can, you know, going back to the entrepreneurial thing, if you can arrange it so that you're making money, you know, in, in basically, a, um, you control your income, but you can live in a cheaper place or surround yourself with people that don't make you feel like you need to go out and blow it all. Um, and then also have the ability to pick a tax free state like Florida or Texas. You're in Texas right now. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. You're enjoying the yep. benefits of being there versus New York. Um, that, yep. that can be tremendous savings, especially as you go up in wage earnings, you know, over $250,000, you're going to start saving a lot of money. I don't know how people in California do it. I just don't know how they do it. I, it would be a huge pill to swallow, uh, more power to them that they're able to do it, yeah. but I could never, I could never do it. But, um, it's a very powerful yeah. lesson to learn at a young age because yeah. people are getting out of college. They have to choose a place to go live. If you go over out to California, or New York, hey, there's money to be made out there, but you're also paying a much bigger price to, to be living and participating. Yeah, the rule in New York, my brother told me, because he got to New York uh, about five years before I did. He's like, so New York is unaffordable unless you are doubling your salary about every 18 months. Wow. In which case, you can sort of do it. And, you know, I did that for six years. But then at a certain point, you're like, do I want to keep doing this? I'm going to go to Texas uh, for a variety of reasons. But, you know, one of them is, gosh, this is hard. You know, you've got to be on a very steep upward trajectory to make it work. And I think, yeah, as you said about California, there's lots of places where I'm sure that's true. Also, mm -hmm. you're not, uh, and you know, there's, there's, there's some boom towns and obviously, um, in California also where it's happening and you know, people are doing, doing better than doubling every 18 months. Right. But, um, but you know, to be on the fringes of that just, just kind of doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, the other thing I was thinking about as you were talking, like uh, you've probably met folks like this who are very successful financially, but somehow managed to be super cheap. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? and, and you're like, that's kind of how they stayed successful financially. Because yeah. if you can control your lifestyle costs, yet have uh, you know a, a quite successful entrepreneurial venture, or uh, have built it over time, and um, and not spend it, or not increase your lifestyle costs to go along with your increased income, that's kind of a key to being and, and retaining wealth. Yeah. Um, it's a it's been an interesting thing for me to discover over time how as I meet you know wealthy people and uh, who have trouble spending money because, you know, it's part of what made them wealthy is they didn't spend money. Mm -hmm. um, I think people, if you, if you haven't been around wealthy people, you might not know that some of them are super duper cheap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have a really hard time spending money, which has its upsides and downsides. The upside at least is it, it tends to keep them wealthy. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. So what's your advice yeah. when it comes to uh, investment advisors? You know, that's another really important point for youngsters, people in college, getting out of college, now there's a lots of, lots of different tools that you, you know, you have alternatives. You might, you might not need that, that hand holding. What do you say? Yeah, that is a key. Well, it's the, it's the, the age old question of the bourgeoisie. Like now that you have a little bit of money, do you need an advisor? And I think that question is shifting. Um, and uh, I think young people are much less likely to go that route. Um, uh, probably for some good reasons, but I'll give you the, the straight down the middle answer for me is that 95% of people, need an investment advisor. Um, and they may only need it for a couple of years, but most people 
don't know yet. If you're getting into the stock and bond investing, and that's not something you have lots of experience with, you probably need an investment advisor uh, for two reasons. One is you might not know how to build your first portfolio. So I think that is, that's role number one investment mm-hmm. advisor. And, and by build a portfolio, uh, the way I describe it is not so much put together a strategy that's going to work according to whether your view of the markets is correct, but rather a strategy that will work even if you're completely wrong. And that is something that not everybody knows how to build. I think you have to build a bulletproof strategy that fits your own psychology as well as your own need for liquidity or not need for liquidity. Anyway, so building the building the program, most people do not have the confidence to do that alone. Mm-hmm. Some people do. I bet um, I do. I don't have an investment advisor, so I don't. <laughs> I'm in part of the 5%. Mm-hmm. Um, I suspect people who listen to Invest Like a Boss are going to be on the far end of interest in money and interest in entrepreneurship and interest in do-it-yourself stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you know, depending on who you are, you may not be in the 95%. But most people don't have our interest in this stuff. So mm-hmm. Most people probably do need that to, to build a portfolio. Then the, the second and only other function that an investment advisor plays, I think, is when the market crashes by 30 to 35%, which it will definitely do. I'm not saying tomorrow, I'm not saying in a year, I'm not saying in 10 years, but it's definitely happening. It's, mm-hmm. And it's probably happening within the decade. And then the investment advisor's role is to hold your hand and say, we talked about this, don't do anything. Mm-hmm. This is part of the plan. The market is not broken. You don't need the money. That's how we designed your plan. So you don't need to pull the money out because that's, that's the hallmark of a good design of a plan. Um, and just hold your hand. And part of the holding hand is to make you feel better. And part of the holding hand is so you don't press sell yeah. on your computer or on your phone. Just hold your hand and talk you through it and remind you, the investment advisor, remind your client, we knew this was going to happen. We didn't know when, we didn't know how big, but this was definitely going to happen. So mm-hmm. part of the plan, we talked about it, don't do anything. So it's just a, a person to tell you not to do anything. And I, from my perspective, that's the only thing that an investment advisor does. If they do more than that, if they tell you I beat the market or I have special access to deal flow or, you know, I can get you great tickets to the basketball game or, you know, all these other things are mm-hmm. relevant and, and not, aren't going to help you make money in the long run. Um, but if they can design a plan and then tell you to not deviate from the plan when the market crashes and you feel like panicked, then that's a good investment advisor. And, and that's like, um, that's such an important thing because that, that's the whole wrench in the compound interest plan. If you yeah. have a 30, 40 year plan, it, you know, yeah. you have to be disciplined for those 30, 40 years for that to work. It only takes one slip up, one emotional withdrawal and sell at the wrong time. And you're, yeah. you know, you screw up that entire plan, right? So yeah. the, the yeah. magnitude of a mistake like that is, is lifelong, really. Yeah, we, we have all sorts. We know from behavioral economics and behavioral finance that we will all do the wrong thing. We all have this monkey mind right. that wants us to sell or trade it around or, or have overconfidence in what we know or have extreme pessimism about what's going on. And the investment advisor is like, no, no, no. We have a 40-year view. We made a plan. And that mm. probably involves... Um, ensuring diversification of some kind. It probably involves rebalancing on some low, low volume, like slow rebalancing, but Mm -hmm. involves some kind of, you know, asset allocation that's um, going to undo our imbalances, Mm -hmm. but is, is sort of irrelevant what the news of the day is or what the news of the year is. It's more of a, what's the 40 year plan. Um, Now I think there's some people and I'll say I'll, I'll put myself in this category. <laughs> I'll brag a little bit. I know I'm I'm bulletproof to that type of panic because I've been through a couple of crashes. So if you've been through a couple of crashes and you know you're not going to panic, then you might be eligible to not have an investment advisor, mm-hmm. I think. But if you haven't been through the crash, and young people generally haven't, but they haven't felt the weightiness of, as you felt early on in college. I mean, that's a great blessing, actually, that you had that. Yeah. I know what it feels like, right? I lost money. It was awful. And then you know how you're going to react or you've, you know, you've thought about it. Um, but so if you know that you're not going to panic, that you're going to remain rational, then there's a plausible argument to be made that you don't need an investment advisor. Um, yeah. And, and you know, the tools of, that have come out in the last 10 years in terms of robo advising are so powerful and easy and simple and great on ramps to investing that it is more likely that the step number one of investment 
advisory, which is build a plan. Like it's very much more plausible than it was 10 years ago that you could do this on your own. So that step has become less necessary, but the psychological role that the investment advisor plays in telling you, you know, not letting your monkey mind screw it up that I, I think, you know, most people don't graduate to that step until they've been through the crash and realized, Oh, I either did the wrong thing or, or I panic. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what will I do next time? And do you know for sure? I like the idea of, of college students starting an account with a robo advisory. I think Vanguard, maybe like, you know, a Vanguard account possibly, uh, mm-hmm. I think the robo advisors in time are going to be really, really fantastic tools. I use one for a small percentage of my portfolio just because I, I think it's an interesting tool that's going to mm-hmm. be very good in the future. But they're going to mm-hmm. have to do a much better job at the point that you made about the psychological and the emotional side. Like, and they'll have so much data because, you know, when markets start to get a little, have a little turmoil, I'm sure logins to those accounts are going to go way up, right? So they're going to see oh, yeah. lots oh, of, yeah. they can almost feel that panic. Um, yep. And they're going to have to come out with some type of, I mean, I think they already are, but if they just had dashboards, it was, you know, let's say that we have a 10% correction and you get hit with a statistic like this has happened, you know, f- over the course uh, on average twice a year for the last X amount of years. I don't, you know, I don't know the stats, yep. but they gave you some stats and history like, hey, don't panic type of thing. Because mm-hmm. if they could, if they could curb that emotional, psychological, uh, you know, challenge that we've been talking about, I think they mm-hmm. would be a really good tool for you know, especially early investors like college yep. students. But I, I'm afraid that without that, they'll the college students or young investors will make that mistake, and it can be pretty damning. You know, like I, it was, oh, yeah. it was a good thing for me to go through in college. But it could have also been a very bad thing if I decided just not to invest in the stock market for the next 10 years because it, I was so bruised and I didn't understand it. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's like any tool, like any technology or tool, there's going to, they're solving some solutions and they have great other problems. And, um, yeah, I, I think robo advising is a neat tool. I agree. It's not a, it, it, it will, it will go wrong as all mm-hmm. as all robots do go wrong. <laughs> We've seen Skynet enough, right? We know right. it's going to go wrong. Yeah. There's some problems here, but it's a it is a it is a movement towards the solution. I'm glad it exists. Mm-hmm. It is not the only thing. The, the other thing I would uh, kind of couch some of the conversation we've been talking about about how to approach this stuff, especially ideas like a hundred percent risky, but also um, could you do some things in robo advising. In my own mind, my advice, um, or the way I push people who I talk to about to think about this is it is relevant for the uh, kind of it's I'm 100 percent confident up to your first five million dollars mm-hmm. after five million up until about 50 million. I think there's some some relevance, but the, I would start to couch it uh, after 50 million. Um, and these are made up numbers that I've made up myself. Then fewer of my rules are true in the sense that. At 50 million, I think wealth preservation becomes just as or more important than growing wealth. Mm-hmm. So, and in that point, you know, bonds becomes a more relevant discussion. Wealth preservation bonds are great, right? Um, not for growing wealth, but for for preserving it. Um, and maybe similarly, you know, definitely robo advising um, is good in the as the on ramp to investing as your needs become more sophisticated. Somewhere in the phase between five million and 50 million. Um, there's other more sophisticated things that I think investment advisors can add value on probably in taxes and yeah. other kinds of diversification above 50 million. You're probably going to go beyond the super simplest index fund, you know, asset allocation rules. So like when I'm talking about college students or people in their twenties, um, my instinct is to keep it super duper simple. And yeah. that's, that works at a, at a less than 5 million sort of thing. <laughs> They're like, Whereas, uh, 50 million, dude, dude I got like 20,000 in debt. Can you help me get out of that first? Right. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so I think it's, I think my advice is relevant for, you know, 99% of people, but yeah. there is a, a point where you're like, actually, you need to be a little bit more sophisticated and you're going to need tax advisory work. You're going to need estate planning work. You're going to need, um, asset sure. allocation work, which goes beyond the simplest, you know, index um portfolio yeah. uh, 100 equities index portfolio obviously yeah well sometimes when we speak to wealthier people and even uh two weeks ago we had on ed connard and um 
I was asking about how he manages his money because I think there's a certain amount of wealth. I don't know what number that is for everybody, but where doing it yourself just it just doesn't make sense anymore. It's too much paperwork. Right. It's too much tax planning. It's it's too much you know account checking and reconciliation. I don't know what that number yep. is, but um, it seems like he just uses one guy, and then that guy subs out tons of accounts to. He's probably got a family office, really, and he subs it out mm -hmm. to maybe 10 other managers that manage all types of different, um, you know, asset classes for him. Uh, and that seems mm -hmm. like that would be kind of a cool thing at some point. You're just like, you know what? Screw it. This do it yourself thing. It's too much for me right now. But then you got to, yeah. you know, you got to have, a, you still have to have a lot of oversight into the, the numbers there and a lot of trust for, for who's managing the account. So, uh, that's yep. not always an easy thing to find either. That's right. Yeah. But I, but that money could be extremely well spent if it frees you up to to do it, do what you like Very to do, point. or do what you're good at, or in the case of Ed Card, write interesting, challenging books, and, and you know, be a intellectual. Absolutely. So, so speaking of books, yeah. I know I know you've probably read a ton of books. Do you have you know four or five favorite investment books that you always recommend to you know to people in your class? I do. Yeah, and and I like I just really think reading books is what is what's gonna get us there in our 20s if you really want to be good at this um, you know i read a blog you guys have your blog give your podcast like that's great but i i really think that books is the way to mm -hmm. um to think of things the way we're supposed to think of things which is in terms of decades not you know days or weeks or months um so you know in order of like what would i give somebody who, who was like a really wanted to be a good student of the markets i would start with burton malkiel random walk down wall street um, which I think is kind of a mind blowing if you, and a good, you know, counterbalance to what we normally do, which is read the, read the financial news of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Jeremy Siegel stocks for the long run for me is pretty formative in terms of the only thing that really provides a return is risky assets. And, and generally the easiest risky asset to access is stocks, uh, which is pretty compelling. And those are classics and they'll make every top 10 list. And there's a reason they're classics. Um, if you were in debt, if you were like looking at your student debt or you had a high interest uh, credit card debt, we already mentioned this, but George Clayson's richest man in Babylon is mm. kind of it's a good, good one. I would point somebody that way. Just super simple, super memorable, you know, step by step, you know, this is all possible. You can get out of debt. You can build wealth. It's not, um, it's not easy on a day-to-day -day basis, but it is simple. Mm -hmm. um, was that book actually then, written like back in the days of Babylon? <laughs> like I, when uh, I was reading no, it, that's no, what I thought it was. But his backstory is he's writing this in the 1920s as a series of essays, and then he kind of you know, and back in the self-published world, you know, wasn't as big then. But he he apparently went like door to door with banks and insurance companies, mm. pushing his stories. Hmm. And eventually people are like, these stories are really good. You should compile these. And he did. Oh, so cool. it, it, I think that it becomes a book by the 30s. Got and it. then it becomes well-known in the 40s. Okay. Um, and then, uh, but interestingly, all these three books I've mentioned, none of them were written in the last 20 years. Um, and in a sense, that's kind of the definition of the classic. It's, um, it's, it is, they have stood the test of time. I guess I would, for somebody who's a, a, a finance nerd, like maybe you and me, uh, the intelligent investor, Benjamin Graham, if you want to understand discounting cash flows and, and where Buffett's sort of mindset comes from, I, he's, he's a very good writer. Mm -hmm. um, and then the one book that I really like that most people have not heard of, it doesn't make the top 10 list, but for me, very informative about both my views on like investment advisors as well as 100% stocks is Nick Murray, Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth. Mm -hmm. okay. He is like one of the clearest writers um, on this stuff and very, he's almost like the Zen master describing how, like, start small, do nothing. Money will grow on money if you <laughs> if you don't sell and if you if you have exposure to to risky stuff, equities in the long in the long run. Uh, those are uh, super powerful for me. There's a bunch of others I can go on and on. Um, cool, but I don't know. You, you, Sounds like you've liked the George Clayson one, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's that one at the end. I um, I'm gonna take a look Nick at. Murray. Yeah, I'm gonna take yeah, a look he, at. But he, um, he's great. Yeah. Yeah, we have we have a list on on the website that we've been compiling. So we're still, you know, we're still getting through a lot of the classics. Um, but yep. I have enjoyed them all. I mean, I pick up almost every book you read. I, I just think I agree with you for, you know, for 20 bucks, where else can you get somebody's entire wisdom and everything that they've learned in their career 
compiled yep. and you're able to just absorb that. So I think it's it's the best bet. I, I wish more smart people wrote books because I think there's something to be taken away from from almost all of them. Yeah, books are built for decades. You know, they're built to last for decades. And a you know, blog post, as much as I love writing a blog post and reading them too, they're built for uh, you know a week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, right. There's a lot more, generally a lot more wisdom and thoughtfulness in the books. Um, you know, Benjamin Franklin wrote stuff um, that in the way to wealth, that 300 years later, you're still like, man, that, that guy's got it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and it's funny in, in investing and in finance, there's not a lot of really new ideas. Most of the stuff has been written before. Yeah. Um, and when you read Benjamin Franklin, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, we kind of knew this 300 years ago. <laughs> um, so it's just a, different ways of packaging um, some of the similar ideas. Um, right. You know. So tell us about you. But yeah, you got a new book out, "The Financial Rules for New College stu- or New College Graduate." Actually, so yep. we've talked on, about some of the the key points, I'm sure. But give us an idea of you know what's different um, and what we haven't discussed that l- readers can look forward to. Yeah. So the big, I'll, I'll mention a couple things. The big pet peeve I've have with, and I've read a lot of personal finance books, is the advice tends to be like, "Do this, do that," and they don't teach the reason why you do this and do that. And by that, I mean, you know, pay off high interest credit card debt, you know, invest for the long run, max out your IRAs and 401ks, you know, don't buy too much insurance. Like all those are great ideas and they're important and inevitably it's what you teach. The background reason for all this is compound interest and discounted cash flows. And so a huge pet peeve of mine is I'm going to teach people to open up a spreadsheet and do this math. And I just have this sense that if you, even if you're a little bit math averse, if you spend you know, 15 minutes figuring this stuff out. And I have some YouTube videos that goes with the book as well. That the, that the, you know, the expert saying, do this, do that becomes much more like, Oh, I get it. That's why you're supposed to do it this way because of the extraordinary growth opportunity of put aside 5,000 bucks or put aside a thousand bucks. That kind of stuff. It's, it's less like, Oh, I have to trust this adult figure telling me to do this. And more like, Oh, I get it. I see how, if I change the, the time, you know, 40 years versus 10 years or, or 12% return versus 6% mm-hmm. return. It's, it's sort of mind blowing when you do it because we don't, we don't often think enough mathematically. Anyway, so that's one of what's one of the ways in which the book is different. I guess the, the second thing I try to do with the book is um, second, third is the second is, as I was just mentioning, the ideas of personal finance. I mean, we've known this stuff since Ben Franklin. We've known this for hundreds of years. It, it doesn't really change the good practices. Um, what's different is, um, can you break it down to the simplest rules? And that's what I attempt to do with each chapter. Like, what are you supposed to know about investing? What are you supposed to know about insurance? What are you supposed to know about retirement planning? What are you supposed to know about high interest credit card debt? And there's only one, two or three things you should know about each thing. And, and the rest is, Sure, spend your lifetime reading everything else. But I'm just going to tell you, here's the one rule, or here's the two rules. So that's my attempt. Um, and then the, the third thing, which I'm, I'm proud of the book, is I think it is I think it is funny and accessible. And while I take these ideas seriously, if you read the book, you're, you're like, okay, the guy doesn't take himself too seriously. It's, there's, mm-hmm. some, there's some humor, and um, I would like to think some goofiness. And um, that that, as uh, Mary Poppins used to say, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Yeah. Um, the, my fondest wish with the book is that people who are not extraordinarily money or finance oriented will pick it up, read the first chapter, and go, oh, I'll give this guy a chance. Like, I don't really think of myself as a money or finance person, mm-hmm. but that was good. Like, that was snappy. And if, if I can read a snappy finance book, I'll keep reading it. Mm-hmm. So that's the goal with it. And I'm, I'm proud of it. I think I succeeded. Excellent. But uh, we'll see. You know, so- we'll see over time. Last week, we spent a lot of time talking about what it means to be wealthy and what financial freedom means. Um, and I think it has different definitions to everybody. But when you think of being truly wealthy, what is what, when it kind of comes to the top of your mind? Yeah, I was so glad you guys addressed that, like financial freedom. Um, and I'll give you the, the answer from the last chapter in my book. But um, there's two different parts to it. One is um, that you have enough, um, in your case, I know you guys emphasize this stuff, passive income. You have enough money coming in to cover your lifestyle costs. That's sort of, um, uh, that's step one. You have to have your, your lifestyle cost covered. And notice in that first step, if you can keep your lifestyle cost down, you have, you're much more close to wealth, right? You're not much closer to financial freedom. So that's, a, that's sort of like key, key step number one. Mm-hmm. Um, 
either keep the lifestyle cost low enough or increase your uh, your passive income enough uh, or both, ideally. Keep the cost low and the passive income high. So, so if you've got step one, uh, that allows you to get to step two of being wealthy, which is so that you can work at what you love to do or work at whatever lights you up and not worry about whether it pays you much or whether it pays you enough or if it pays you something or nothing at all, but the thing lights you up. Um, then, then you're there, man, you're wealthy. Um, and it is, it impresses the hell out of me that you guys who are younger than me have been like, we're doing this podcast, presumably because you just love it. Like you're not making money off this, but because <laughs> who you told love, you, you, who told you? About, <laughs> <laughs> it's on your website. You're like, you know, we do this thing because we love talking yeah. about this stuff. Yeah. And we have, a measure of freedom from some past activities and financial success to do this thing, which we love. And so that tells me that you guys are on the path, you know, yeah. um, I myself am on the path. I wouldn't say I am there yet. Like I still would like to make money, <laughs> but I'm, I've made some choices that allow me to uh, spend more of my time doing the things I love that light me up rather than going, okay, I got a nickel and dime this, this scenario here, or, or I have to make work choices that, you know, put me in a dead end job or a job I don't like doing the thing. So I do what I like. Um, mm -hmm. and that gets me pretty close to being wealthy. Um, and it's fun to see, it, it seems like you guys are on that same path too, yeah. right? Cover yeah. your lifestyle costs and then do stuff that just lights you up. Love it. I love and, it. My, yeah. Mike, it's been a lot of fun. Great episode in depth on financial tips that professors didn't teach us. I think it's a great lesson for, not only younger listeners, but also older listeners that have kids that are growing up or plan to have kids because the, the lessons that you teach early on to youth, um, you know, if you can get kids starting to save money when they're eight years old off their allowance or they're working at the golf course and summer jobs and stuff versus blowing in on Red Bulls, uh, that money's going to go a long way. So these are all really important lessons. We appreciate you coming on and sharing them with you. And we will uh, leave links to, of course, your book. And John and I are doing a little exit commentary coming up. So, Mike, thanks again for coming on, man. It's been a complete pleasure. Thanks, Sam. That was a ton of great information, things that I wish I knew in university. And regardless of where you guys are right now in your investing and kind of finance journey, make sure you actually know what your net worth is, where your money is going, how much you have in debt, as well as what assets you have. Uh, the best thing you guys can do is use something, a tracker like personal capital, which is what I use, and you can get a free account and it basically just updates all of your accounts in one place. Go to investlikeaboss.com slash personal to make a free account today. So Sam, what did you think about your chat with Michael? Just opened my mind again to things that, you know, we've been fortunate enough to start learning at a young age, whether through lessons in college or our own personal ambitions and goals out of college. Um, I think even with this podcast, you know, we're in our mid thirties, but I think we're learning a lot of things that a lot of people don't rein in until their forties, fifties. But it reminds me how difficult it is when you're in your 20s or even in, when you're before that, when you're a teenager, to think about these things because the way that we think right now is not the same that when you think when you're 18, right? You're just a totally different human being that thinks differently and money is a lot more abstract in a sense. Uh, you haven't gone and put in those 40-hour those work weeks. You haven't you, you know, you haven't chased your, your financial ambitions, you're chasing other things. So it's really hard for any of, of us to make a direct comparison to where we're at now to where we were when we're 18 and try to go back and teach your 18 year old self because you're just a different per person. So we have to really reframe our brains in order to pass on these lessons to younger people. Yeah. And I actually think that they've done studies showing that, you know, people under the age of, you know, whatever it was, let's say 25 are actually incapable of really thinking that long term compared to people mm -hmm. who are a little bit older. And this explains why, you know, I, I've done so many dumb things when I was a teenager. And I'm sure both you and everyone else listening has as well. It's because, you know, we're just like, ah, you know, F it, you know, like let's just enjoy now you know, YOLO, and let's just think about the short-term success as well as kind of the ups and downsides of what's going to happen right away, where it's really, really hard to fathom or imagine how this will affect us 
even five years from now, but definitely not 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. Yeah, I think that's why the the book Rich Dad Poor Dad was so impressionable in college because instead of just – let's just speak of like investing. OK, we're talking to a 20-year-old and it's important to save. It's important to you know, start a, start a Vanguard account, start, start learning these things, right? It's very hard when you think of it in the abstract or, OK, if you invest and make 5% a year and it grows, grows, grows – I just don't think kids get that. It's just it's too long of a time horizon. But the reason Rich Dad Poor Dad's great is because it, it teaches you to think differently about fun, money. But also when you frame it with real estate, it gives you something tangible that's not that far off, right? Okay, if you save fifty thousand dollars, you can make a down payment on a three hundred thousand dollar house, and that you can rent out for the rest of your life, and it's going to pay you x amount of money per month for the rest of your life, and you're going to build equity, and you're going to have cash flow for life, right? I think that's such an easier way for a younger person to digest it because it gives them an actual goal that's not too far out in the future that if they get started with that, they can reach that goal, they can acquire a piece of property, and then they can own something tangible that they can go use, they can put their friends in, they can touch it, and it's going to pay them for the rest of their life. And I th- I know that book is is tremendously popular with others as it has been for us, Johnny, and it's a great book that f- frames it in a good way for younger people. Yeah, definitely. I think that should be required reading in high school. You know, we mm. forget just a uh, university or college. I think by then it's, you know, they really need it, but these are things that are good to start learning or, or start thinking about be- before you get your first credit card, before, you know, you go to college and, and think about what you want to do with your life or um, what your plans are going to be. These mm-hmm. are, you know, really things that should be taught in both college and university, and it's way more important than everything, all the other subjects I've taken. I mean, do you, do you actually remember any big takeaways about personal finance that you took from high school or college? No, <laughs> not at all. No, it was all through learning. I mean, the, the biggest thing that I learned was when I was 18 and in college, I got arrested four times my freshman fall. So I immediately like upon getting into school, I had like $10,000 worth of legal bills and, you know, bullshit. Right. But fortunately for me, when I was in high school, I always, every opportunity I had to make money, I always took it. So I was always working a night job, a summer job, uh, a weekend job, golf course, tennis courts, restaurants, and I was always saving. Um, so fortunately when I incurred this stuff as a freshman in college, I didn't go into debt for it. I had savings. Uh, it really, really sucked to blow, you know, eight summers of savings on <laughs> legal bills when you're 18. But um, but at least I didn't go into debt. So you, you, everyone takes a different path to learning. But through mine, it was it was all experience. I mean, I fell asleep in every single class I ever went to. So I wasn't learning much in college, especially not at Florida State. I actually remember... Uh, so I, I started at a city college, like a community college. And I remember on my, one of my first days there, I was so bored in class that I was mm. reading through one of those pamphlets that they, they leave in the back of the classroom. And it was about how to get a credit card. It was like an application. So I literally filled out my first credit card application ever while sitting in my community college class, having no idea, you know, how to use it or mm-hmm. what you know, 24.95% APR really was. <laughs> and I remember during the section where they wrote, you know, like how much money do you earn? I just checked the biggest box and I think it was like 250,000 a year. And I was this 18 year old college kid working at an ice cream store. <laughs> and they sent me a credit card with, I think it was living like a, in a living room. <laughs> yeah, li- yeah. Living literally in someone's living room. And they sent me a, a a card with, I think, like a $15,000 limit or something. And luckily, thank God that I grew up with frugal parents that, oh. you know, never overspent because that would have gotten me in so much trouble. Damn. That's like my spending limit now, Johnny. <laughs> that's so a lot, you know, yeah. but a lot of people will get out of control of that, right? So, I mean, these, you can, you can screw things up pretty bad. If you don't have someone at least giving you some guidance or don't have some self control, uh, in college I only I had a debit card. I never had a credit card. Uh, I think it would have been more helpful to get a, a credit card, but at least with a debit card you can only spend what's in the bank, and there wasn't much. There was never much in the bank. 
But, you know, if you could go back, Johnny, and think of right now, you have, let's say you have a 12 year old nephew and you can give him kind of one piece of financial advice. What's the, what's the first thing that just jumps out of the seat at you? Like, make sure you do this. Make sure you understand compound interest because okay. that applies on both sides. First, that applies on if you just pay the minimum on your credit card, how quickly that interest compounds against you and how you're going to dig yourself in a, in a hole for the rest of your life. Uh, and on the flip side, if you compound the interest in an investment account, how that can make you a multi-millionaire by the time you retire, even if you're just putting in, you know, a couple hundred bucks here and there when you're, when you're young. Yeah. I like that. What about you? I like that. What, what tips would you give your 12 year old? I think the most important thing I would try to push them into would be to just, well, this, the goal would be to graduate debt free, but in order to build into that is just to experience as much little side jobs as you can uh, before college because I think it's particularly difficult to work in college. But when you're in high school, it's a, it's a great opportunity to get summer jobs, work at golf courses, work at restaurants. And I think working in hospitality should also be mandatory for everybody because, you know, you end up respecting people that work at restaurants and do a lot of these jobs a lot more. You probably end up tipping better. But I think, you know, experiencing that stuff gives you a lot more flavor for making decisions on what you want to major in and also what you want to do after college. If you've had the opportunity to work a lot of different jobs, make different types of money uh, and work in different industries. But it also give you the opportunity, you know, if you work a summer job for four or five summers in high school or just like a weekend job at a golf course or something, it's going to give you the opportunity to graduate debt free because you can definitely save you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars uh, in high school, just working this this side jobs for sure, uh, making a lot of cash, a lot of cash and tips and stuff is a good way to to get through long summer days. Yeah, actually, so uh, I don't know if you heard it, but on my other podcast, Travel Like a Boss, I interviewed a guy who was he when he was young, he went to Alaska to clean fish for a a summer. Great. Right? And he made, I think it was like $60,000 in a few months just scaling fish. And he said it was a terrible job. He smelled like crap. He almost got eaten by a bear. Uh, but with that 60 grand, we did the math and we were like, if you, if he had just invested that in something and he invested nothing else for the rest of his life, he would have a million dollars. Yeah. I mean, and especially if you do it at a young age, right? If you do it when you're 17 years old. You put that money to work. By the time you get out of college, it's already had six years to, to grow. Yeah. So actually my, my other, <laughs> other advice would be if you want to take that big gamble, take it when you're 18 because imagine if when you're 18 years old, you took out as much debt as possible. You know, you got one of these credit cards with 15 grand worth of, uh, you know, with a balance. You took out two, three, four of them. You bought, you know, you bought a house and you just rolled the dice and like, I'm just going to go for it. I'm either going to triple my money or I'm just going to declare bankruptcy because at 18 or 19, your bankruptcy will clear in, you know, seven or 10 years. And by the time you actually need to use your credit when you're 28 or something, you want to buy a house, it would have cleared already. <laughs> well, that's, uh, it's interesting, but, um, you know, I think, uh, I, unfortunately, I just don't think enough people have enough experience and knowledge to be able to undertake that process and, and win the majority of times. Um, I just think there's too many unforeseeable variables that you learn as as you as you kind of toe into this stuff. But I definitely agree with trying to start something while you're in college. It doesn't have to be a huge gamble, but it can be start a WordPress site, start an e-commerce site, import something from China and, and flip it on Amazon. You try to do something that's entrepreneurial while it's in college and the risk is low, but you can also see because entrepreneurship's not for everybody. Um, and if some people you can look, you can fail four or five times and they still know no matter what, they're going to be an entrepreneur. They're going to have their own business and other people try something once and they immediately know it's not for me. No, I'm, I want a steady paycheck. I want to live in one area. Uh, and, and that's fine. There's, there's different paths of life, but if you can figure that out at an earlier age and definitely have something, some fire in you that you can't extinguish and that you know that that's going to be your, your mission, well, you can, you can make a lot of better decisions for that. If you figure that out in college versus if you figure that out when you're 35. I like it. So 
I'm curious if you were to redesign the college curriculum, the requirements, reg- you know, regarding personal finance or uh, investing or kind of just everything on this side. What are some classes or some um, some skills that you would make a requirement for everybody to graduate with? I would definitely make it much more hands on out of out of the actual course. Uh, so I think the course I would try to design much more as recapping around experiences. So instead of sitting there l- listening to books and a professor, I, mean, I literally could not stay awake in course. Like I think I had some type of sleeping disease as soon as that professor got up and started talking, I just, it's lights out for me. And, but I think people just learn through experience. So I'd push it much more into internships. Okay. Tuesday, Thursday, you're going to this job to shadow this guy for this, for the semester. And Wednesday, Friday, your course is something that's hands on at some facility, you know, on college campus where you're actually working a job or you're building, you, you know, you're building some type of business. But I think you have to, you have to get people out and, teach them through doing much more than teach them through reading and then use course curriculum much more as a recap of that experience. That would be, you know, yeah. that would be my advice, but that's how, that's how I learned. So I like I know, it. I like I it a lot. I think that regardless if someone is taking a business degree, I think every single degree out there should have some kind of um, mock or real business program where, mm-hmm. you know, let's say you want to be, a hairdresser or something, you know, I think they should just have you just create either a actual business and, you know, on, um, and have that be part of your final project or mm-hmm. even a mock one where it's pretend, but at least you're, you know, you're going through all the, you know, all the kind of nuances of opening a business. Um, yeah. Because I, I, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. This is where people learn, you know, the most and who knows they might end up, you know, saying, Hey, that's too much stress. I don't want to have to manage all this. I'd rather be a great employee and, you know, great employees are needed as well. But I think what will happen is even if they did that, they would understand the stress and the, you know, the responsibilities of being the owner or being the boss. And for being, you know, an entrepreneur, I think, you know, running a small business, I really think teaches you so many skills that are vital. So I think everyone before they graduate college should know how to do a profit and loss statement or balance sheet, some kind of basic Excel, basic accounting. These are things that are so valuable, not only with any business, but also with your personal life. Second, I think everyone should understand how to use a credit card and what the reper- repercussions are of compounding interest on that side, as well as having some kind of either, you know, real or fake investment account where everybody kind of learns and sees what actually happens, um, when the stock market goes up and down. I think an easy exercise would be in the beginning of the year, uh, every, everyone gets, you know, a, a fake money account. And instead of just following the real stock market, which, you know, might, you know, might just go up the whole year, they should just accelerate it and say every week is like one year in the stock market or every month is one year in the stock market and just see how people react kind of through, through that going up and down. Uh, mm-hmm. or, I mean, as easy as just having people play the, the board game cash flow 101, you know, and figuring out like how people invest and, and what they do when things are up and down. Yeah, and I would just add on to that that I think everyone should, by the time they get out of college, should have tried to open uh, their Roth IRA account. And uh, th- this is a, you know, this was one of Michael's uh, things that he pushes on his class. This is a really difficult one for kids to think about when they're 18 years old, because you're not thinking that you're even going to live to be 60 years old. And if you do, do you want money then, or do you want money now? But the effects of growing money, cash are tax free from the age of 18 until you're 60. Even if you don't continue to fund it after college, you should at least start it and put some money into it then so you can understand the effects of compounding interest, especially at a tax free level. So I think that's a really important one and a definitely one for uncles, parents to drive home to their kids at a young age. If they have that summer job and they're bringing in that money, go ahead and start that their Roth IRA and get them set up with a tax free account. It's a safety net, if nothing else, that allows them to go out and gamble, make bigger gambles, take bigger risks and their own entrepreneurial efforts throughout life when they know they have that little bit of a safety net that's going to be there if they screw things up when they're 60. So a few years ago, my my sister ha- had some kids. Um, I think they're maybe six and eight now. But I remember every year, in, like 
instead of buying a birthday present or a Christmas present, I just said to my sister, I was like, look, like, they're, they're not going to appreciate these gifts. They have too many toys anyways. I'm just going to make, I'm going to put money into an account for them. So I actually made a sub account on my, my Charles Schaub, um, brokerage and I just named it Karina and Jet. And mm. I, I've so far put in about $2,000, uh, into their account. It's just anytime I would normally spend, um, you know, on a, on a gift or something or buying them crap they don't need. I just put it into, you know, basically VTI, like a, a Vanguard total index fund, uh, or SCHC, which is Charles Schaub's version of it because it's free. Uh, and so far that $2,000 has, you know, gone up, uh, by 31%. So it's now up mm-hmm. at 600 and no, sorry, $2,781. And what I'm going to do is basically every year, I'm just going to print this out for them and let them see the kind of like ups and downs of their account. And yeah. hopefully they'll learn from that. You know, they'll be excited just to get this piece of paper instead of a, a gift every year. And hopefully that'll kind of teach them about investing, how they can see it growing kind of throughout the years, even yeah. if I never put any more money in. I like it. Oh, the flea market story. So my buddy, um, his dad bought him, I guess, basically local stock in a local flea market when he was like, nine years old, right? He used to take him to the flea market. The kid loved the flea market. And he had the opportunity to buy ownership in this in the in the flea market setup. I don't know how it actually works, but that since he was nine has now grown to uh the flea market runs every single month. And w- what they do is they they collect money from the tenants, um almost like a, a REIT in a sense. And then they distribute that to the to the all the different owners each month. So every single month now he gets a check for thirty four hundred dollars. What? Thirty four hundred dollars. How much did they put in in the first place? I don't know. Um, it was I think it was like a small uh, a piece of like his uh, like his inheritance from a grandma and or something, and they invest it in this. And um, and the flea market's grown, 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 done tremendously well. So now like that, but that was a big college decision for him because it was when he was in college, it was like 2,800 or something. He's like, wow, I have enough to live off of almost right here. So he made a a decision in college to pursue um, like digital arts where he's now a very talented cinematographer and, um, and, you know, high, high end editor. But uh, he doesn't work full time. He works for himself. He, he picks and chooses projects that he wants uh, because the money's not as important, right? He lives a really nice lifestyle and he lives basically 50% off his, his flea market stuff. Uh, my parents did something similar for me when I was young, not to this degree of success, but they bought me stock in Disneyland when I was about 10. I think it was like $300 worth of stock. And I still have that. It's like a paper certificate. And it was cool because every six months I would get a, a check from Disney. Uh, and when you're 10, you get a check from Disney World and your parents are like, hey, you're a co-owner in Disney World. Like when you go there, you know, you you own part of this. And then they send you a check for, you know, 20 bucks every six that months or something. Awesome. But it was really, really cool um, getting that check from Disneyland when you're like 10 and you're in school and like, yeah, Disney just paid me. And um, I think little things like that that are not huge investments, but you can teach your kids a valuable lesson, show them the, the benefit of putting money to work for you. And that the fact that you can own parts of great companies that you really, really love at that time in your life and you can be a, a co-owner of that is pretty cool. I absolutely love that. I, I really, really like that. So instead of, you know, spending a couple hundred bucks on a a toy Tesla that they can drive around in, which, you know, would be fun for a few weeks and then they kind of forget about it and put it in the garage, you can buy them three hundred dollars with the Tesla stock. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love it. I love it. That's great. So guys, this is a follow up from another episode that we actually did back in the day. It was episode 11 of Invest Like a Boss, and it was called Advice for 17 to 24-year-olds. So that is a great episode to listen to next. Uh, please, please, please share this episode as well as that other one with anyone you know who is in college or younger because this is the information that we want to put out there because we really think and we know it's going to change people's lives. And they're going to thank you for it. They're going to thank us for it. And... It's just going to – I mean it really can set the foundation of success, of financial success and financial literacy for 
people that you love. So share this episode. Uh, if you want more people to be able to find it, go on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Give us a rating because that helps a ton as well. And we will see uh, all of you guys next week. So long from Tampa, Johnny. All right. See you guys next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment folios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.